I remember in 2001 when the announcement was made that we had to join that group. We were all afraid, but he told us he would do it, and he did it. So thank you very much again, sir. A debt of gratitude. Ladies and gentlemen, also help me welcome a man who, um, if you have followed industry, he is, he, he's a street shooter when it comes to speaking about that sector. In fact, he once headed the Association of Ghanaian Industries, and he's still the CEO of Tropical Cables and Conductors Limited, Dr. Otin JC. Dr. Otin you thank you very much for coming. A round of applause again as we welcome Dr. Otin JC. Doc, thank you very much for coming. And I would invite you, Mr. Otin JC, to set us off by, let me invite you to the, let me invite you to the podium to set us off with your initial thoughts on this very important conversation. Initial thoughts. You know, a few years ago, um, I think it was one of your anniversaries, Graphic, the Graphic Group published um, uh, a bunch of old graphic issues. It was your 50th anniversary or something from the earliest times. And it has become one of my favorite bedtime reading publications. And last night when I was going through it, I came across an interesting article written in 1962. And it was reporting a then minister of state calling on Ghanaians to buy made in Ghana. And this was Krobo Duse in 1962, pleading how many years down the line we are still talking about encouraging people to buy made in Ghana. The point of the matter is that moral suasion has very limited effect. Appeals and cries and that kind of policy doesn't work. No matter how much you appeal, people will not change their behaviors just because of your appeal. Why are you wearing Made in Ghana today? It is available. It is comfortable. Somebody marketed it to you. It is affordable. Somebody has done all that work. That is why today, how did Friday wear become Friday wear and everybody is wearing something on Fridays? It's because some policymaker went beyond mere moral suasion and tried to put in effect policies which would result in it. And that is really the main point of this matter. You will find out that almost every government has been sincere in seeking to encourage manufacturing in our country. So how come it's failing? Immediately it means that sincerity of intention is not enough. We have had three strategies towards industrialization over time. Industrialization based on local raw material, either agricultural produce or, or, or local minerals, local metals. So we say that we have rubber, so we'll do ties. We have also tried what is called the import substitution model, where we try to manufacture things which we normally import to do things here which we use. And then we have tried also what we call the, the free zone. What we call it in effect is export-led industrialization, where you are producing for export. And that is where the free zones and those people come in. What is, what is a free zone really? A free zone is an area where you try to mimic the best conditions that the countries you are competing with have. So you designate a company or an area as a free zone, 
and you said you can bring in things duty free. We try and keep the cost of power low. We try and make sure you have water. You try and make sure that even labor regulations are suspended if you are in a free zone. The whole point is that you want to mimic the conditions in the best countries. And essentially, these three strategies for industrialization have worked everywhere else. Anybody who tells you that they don't work or they are no longer relevant is not telling you the truth. As recently as we are talking of 10 years ago, Vietnam started using it. And now Vietnam is the latest Asian tiger. And it's the same policies. So how come that we have been trying these policies over time and yet we don't seem to be getting anywhere with it. Three reasons which I think it will be useful for us uh, to, to, to look at. The first is that in every economy, you start by planning. You talk about planning. You can't get anywhere without planning. You must have a strategy. You must have a plan. Then you need to implement the plan. Alongside implementing it, you are likely to find out that problems and issues come up because it's impossible to forecast whatever you want to do 100%. So you keep reviewing. And as you review, you make changes to the plan as you go along. But in the midst of it all is the one, I call it the soft issue. It's the one soft issue, whether in your planning or in your execution or in your review, you cannot leave out. And that is the issue of discipline. You need discipline. And discipline comes along with sanctions for those who don't follow the plan, who undermine the plan, who make it difficult for the plan to be activated. So you cannot have discipline without sanctions. And once you get this into your system, I am sure that there is no way you can have those problems. I mean, these are, these are issues which are of a national character. What is the character of your nation? What are, what are their core values as a nation? And these are the core values that you need if you are to industrialize. Because the variables, and they will tell you finance, uh, marketing strategy, uh, technology, I mean, all those variables are available. And they keep changing. They are dynamic. So it is important that whatever you are doing, you keep reviewing it. And you always have people who will seek to undermine what you are doing. It's part of human nature. So you need discipline and you need sanctions. I'll give you an example. I mean, Ghana timber used to be used locally for making lumber, sawn timber, which was just semi-processed, furniture, which is a finished product. And then we used to make safety matches. I don't know how many of you remember, but we used to make safety matches in Ghana. Safety matches has been overtaken by technology. So really, it is not a huge thing anymore. Furniture is being overtaken by glass and steel and plastic. So if you started out to use your timber to do these things, all of a sudden, the market is gone. And that is why you need to be constantly reviewing what you are doing. 
We used our rubber in those days as part of our import substitution to make tires. It was, I mean, Firestone tires in Ghana. Later on became Bonsata, huge industry. I mean, it was. A couple of years ago, I was in Takwa, and I decided to go and see the old tire factory because it had been put up for divestiture, and I thought that, why not take a look at it and see if you can uh, to buy it, to put it bluntly, and put it back to work. I saw a factory with new equipment because somebody had taken a 10 million pound or something loan in those days. And uh, before they could work, something, one of the things in Ghana had happened. So new equipment shut down and everything. So I was given a tour of the plant. I looked at everything. And then when I came back, I called my tire technology experts who I'd been talking to, gave them the report, and they said, look, the equipment list that you have from there is outmoded. It's of no use now. Uh, the kind of tires they used to make there, rim 12, rim 13, rim 14, those tires have now all gone synthetic. So there is very little natural rubber there. Rubber tires now are mainly used for huge uh, tractors and caterpillar tires. But for the sort of vehicle tires you are looking at, the technology has moved on. So I said, so what is the worth of all that equipment sitting there? He said, the best thing we can do is to throw all of it away and uh, retool because they are in a mining area. Mining is big in Ghana. And let's do huge rubber tires. And then later on, we can look, bring in the technology to do the synthetics and do the, the smaller tires. So I went to talk to Divestiture, who were in charge of it. And they were fixated that we had put how many million pounds in this and this is the worth of the plant sitting there. And if you want to buy it, well, this is the, the value that we have. And I told them that you don't, have, you don't know what you're talking about. But this is the, this is the nature of the ever-changing variables, which as a nation, if we want to pursue industrialization, we must be ready to look for. From there, I went to look at the glass manufacturing facility. Similar, similar story. So really, government should be paying somebody to take those facilities off their hands and put new, new objectives in mind. Look, you can have it for one penny and promise me that in two or three years you will have uh, 300 people working there. We need new objectives if we are to do some of these things, to revisit some of those old factories which we keep talking about. And it is, it is the kind of thing which we never stop, we never stop talking about. The other thing, and I think it came up in the ladies' uh, presentation, you know, is the fact that we live in a situation where whatever you can produce in Ghana today, somebody out there will be prepared to sell it to you at a lower cost than what you can do in Ghana today. So if you are going after low cost for your people, if that is your objective as a nation, then you cannot have an industrializing economy. Because if even you buy the machines and buy the people and buy everything, your people don't have the experience to achieve the productivity which more experienced people have done, have gone ahead of us and done. So does it mean that we should fold up our hands and, and give up on industrialization? The answer is no, because there is also policy which makes up for it. 
In addition to the often stated uh, objective of giving revenue to government, you know, the role of import duty and other import tariffs is to take account of the operating differences between countries. So electricity in China is one third of the price of electricity in Ghana. Whilst government works to bring down that cost, in the meantime, you look at it and decide that. So for the manufacturer in Ghana, I'm going to put an import duty of 3% or 5% or, or whatever to make up for that difference. But it's not a difference which is going to stay forever. It's not a duty you are going to charge forever. You keep reviewing the situation. And that means your local manufacturers know that as the price of power comes down, as your road infrastructure improves in the industrial areas, as your labor becomes more productive and more experienced and skilled, those tariffs will come down. If you don't do that, then you don't know how to get industrialization going. I'm not talking about protection between high tariff rules because that doesn't work. But duty to make up for differences in operating environment. And we try and do that in Ghana. In Ghana, you'll find that import duty, 5%, 10%, 15%. But we do it in a, in a excuse me to say, but in a rather lazy way. We put four bands, very easy to calculate, very easy to collect. In other places, somebody does the detailed work, industry by industry. What really is the differences for somebody producing uh, fabrics, somebody in the textiles production, as against somebody producing uh, uh, cutlery? And make sure that you look at what import structure. If you look at the Americans, the way they use the harmonized code, the global harmonized code, there are many, many subdivisions, and they go through and decide which ones. This should be 5%, this should be 3.5%, this should be 4%, this should be 0%, this should be 20%. And that is the way you use tariffs, you use import duty you, as a tool for your industrialization. The unfortunate thing in our country is that even when we try to do that, we find out that the lack of discipline and the lack of sanctions has resulted in those, even those minor tariffs that we have legitimately put in place by government. We are unable to collect it. I mean, how can government decide that when you bring in a, a, a crockery, napkins, you have to pay a duty of 10%. And yet, you can go through the port in Ghana without paying that. But this is what is happening. They misdescribe the goods, they undervalue the goods, they change the quantity, the volumes, to smaller than it is. You see somebody who has a container, and he claims the container has only two tons of uh, uh, material. You see uh, uh, invoices being generated locally. And then when we try, when government and the policymakers recognize this as a problem and try and say, let's do something about it, we get bogged down in, is it a cargo trading, what, CTN, or is it a something, some other system, or is it some other system? And we have trade associations, we have people uh, 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 fighting over it. I mean, what should, why should it be so? We are doing things to protect businesses who, whose very existence is based on breaking the law. I mean, criminal activity is the business model that some people have. 
So somebody makes fruit juices in Ghana and he cannot sell it because 90% of the fruit juice coming to Ghana has a wrong valuation on it or has wrong quantities resulting in the same effect. So we live in Ghana and we are importing fruit juices and we talk about encouraging people to buy made in Ghana. Who would walk into a shop and see two products, one for uh, uh, 10 CDs and one for five CDs and say that I'm a Ghanaian so I'll buy the 10 CD one. <laughs> I mean, we lost the game right at the port, right at the beginning at where we are allowing the import to come in and so, one of our biggest fruit juice manufacturers in this country, his best market is Nigeria. Without Nigeria, he will shut down his plant in Ghana. Because he can get into Nigeria because there, is, there, there are proper tariffs. They insist on collecting it. In fact, sometimes in Nigeria, they will even ban exports, except that it's coming from West Africa and the ECOWAS trade liberalization scheme. And here in our country, it cannot go on. So if he decides that, look, I'm going to shut down my factory and move to Nigeria, that is deindustrialization. That is the reverse of what you want. But it is happening. There's an FMCG goods manufacturer listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange. He has a similar problem. He tries to talk to government about it. People tell him, go and be competitive. Yeah, so you are not competitive. How can I be competitive when your own import duty collection is being undermined? So what does he do? He shuts down the factory. 400 Ghanaians are out of work. He centralizes all his production in a neighboring country. And he starts importing into Ghana. That is deindustrialization. Without, without, and it's all because of what? Indiscipline. In just making sure that your own rules are followed. So when we talk about industrializing, you can't industrialize in an indisciplined country. Many of you have been to China, you have been to Malaysia, you have been to the South Asian, the Asian tigers. The only difference between them and us is discipline in implementing the law, trade policy. But I tell you, it's the same strategies. Import substitution, export-led industrialization, uh, 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 processing of uh, locally available raw material is the same. And they continue the same policies today. But we sit here and we wring our hands and we cry out in agony and we think that things are not going right and somebody says, Africans, what is wrong with us? Yes, what is wrong with us? It's that we are, we refuse the discipline of following our own laws. Of course, there are other things which help, like having a, a country strategy. And it's also, you know, you don't need to do all these things at the same time. What you could decide is that for my country, I'm looking at processing. Just, just look, even at processing, what goods can I process? So I can grow oranges, I can grow mangoes, I can grow pineapples, so I can grow plantain, I can make plantain chips, it's a big product now. And let's start with that and make sure that the differences between the countries we import from, whether it's South Africa or it's wherever, and our country represents this amount in tariff. Let me put that amount there. Make sure that it is paid and then grow that industry. As you, you, you grow more of it, as you set up uh, 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 what do you call it, bigger farms, your cost of production comes down, your, 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 your availability of raw material improves, you integrate the industry backwards. 
Because that is all part of the dynamism of industrialization. So you integrate it backwards and you make sure that you are going into mass production of the raw material. We have an AGI manufacturer in Kumasi who processes uh, soya bean and things, and he can't get the soya bean, and he is uh, bringing it from Brazil, or even blue skies. Blue skies is importing fruit. Where is the national strategy to promote fruit processing and making sure that enough fruit is being grown so whatever it is you need to, to grow fruit, who is identifying the fruit farmers? Who is finding out whether it makes sense at all for them to sell their fruit to a processor? Do they make a margin? If they don't make a margin, why don't they make a margin? What can I do to help them make a margin? Is it the cost of fertilizer? Is it the availability of land? Is it lack of irrigation? Those are the things a national strategy forces you to do. I mean, countries have worked on whole products. When Japan decided that it was going to take over the watch industry in the world, we all know the big names for, the, for, for watches around the world, the Swiss companies. All of a sudden, Casio and all those Japanese companies went into watch making because they recognize a certain technological advantage they could have and put money into the research and change from analog watches to digital watches and left the Rolexes to high-class watches. They changed they change the world industry. It's a country strategy. Where is our country strategy? We just talk and appeal and, 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 and moan and agonize but where is our country strategy? We have an industrialization plan. I've seen various ministers of trade inaugurate an industrialization plan. And we have farm fair and we come and we, we, we inaugurate it. And after that, what happens? Where is the work program for it? Who is following up on it? Who is reviewing it? Who is making the changes required to it as we go along? And yet we claim that we want to integrate. And our early industries, Ghana started making television sets before Korea, black and white television sets. We were in a collaboration with Philips. Later on, we rebranded it to Akasanoma. I don't know if those of you old enough to remember, we were assembling Sanyo products here. But as you do these things, you see, light industry, electronic assembly in manufacturing is the end of the chain. It's good to start at the end of the chain. It's the easier bit to get into. But you need to integrate it backwards. So as you are doing that, this is a nation which has iron ore sitting in the, in the north. You have power. So what is stopping your iron and steel industry? You have banks prepared to finance it. Maybe our, our uh, manufacturers, our businesses are too small. But that is where a national strategy comes in. So government takes over and does it. And you, have, you produce the steel goods which go on to feed the so-called white consumer goods uh, manufacturing and assembly. So all of a sudden, you are making your own fridge doors. You are making your electric fans. Why should a country import electric fans? Pieces of steel cut, shaped, glossed, a rod, painted. I mean, and I wonder, sometimes I think that, I mean, that there is so much to do. If we really, and we used to make electric fans in Ghana, by the way. We used to make electric fans. We used to make pressing ions. We, I mean, we used to make all those things. The question is, why has this happened? It has happened because we don't realize the dynamic nature on, of manufacturing. You cannot say today I'm making uh, incandescent bulbs. We used to make bulbs in Ghana. 
And so every day I'm making bulbs, and the technology is changing, and you are making bulbs, and your nation is... In other places, your research people know that you are making bulbs, and they keep the technology side going, and they are feeding it into you. So you make bulbs for 10 years, the technology moves on, and then the company collapses, and we say we used to make bulbs. <laughs> Today, Apostle Safo is assembling vehicles. Beautiful. My company just bought a pickup from him. Excellent uh, 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 vehicle, you know. But those of you who are old enough know we used to assemble Nissan Datsun. We used to assemble trucks in Ghana from Leyland to Neoplan. We used to assemble them here. We used to assemble motorbikes. Thomas, the factory was in Kumasi. Thomas from Czechoslovakia. We are assembling them here. Why must it take a whole generation for us to come back to what we were doing 30, 40 years ago? Because we are not planning. By now, we shouldn't just be assembling vehicles. We should be actually manufacturing vehicle parts. And again, this is the collaboration between government and industry. Recently, last year, uh, some information came out that the government of uh, Australia, apparently for four decades, had been paying Toyota, a Japanese uh, car manufacturer, to manufacture cars in Australia. For four decades, they had been giving them a subsidy towards it. The government of South Africa today is talking to German car manufacturer, you know which, about continuing to assemble uh, uh, their brand in South Africa. That is the role of government in these things. And they don't just give them a subsidy to do it, but you do the calculation. So if we give you a subsidy, then we require that you get a local person to make brake bands for you. You get a local person at the West to make your upholstery for you. Car upholstery, there are people in Ghana who do car upholstery very well. So bring your, 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 your own standards to them and help them make it. And you decide which of the inputs you want to be done locally. And get into an arrangement with that top brand you want to attract into your country. So who is looking at Apostle Safo? Even when ministers of state are being encouraged to drive his car, people, people don't, they would, no, they would rather drive an imported car. Why should it be so? The nation must have a strategy. The nation must pursue the strategy. It must pursue it in line with the local people, people in industry, People who, I mean, people have, have, in Ghana, we have very smart people. And if we give them a chance and give them a little support, there is no industrialization that we cannot do. I'll just end by, by, by calling on some of you. Sometimes when I listen to the radio, and it's not just about industrialization, these principles Apply to any kind of production you want, even agricultural production. We must be, we must be happy that our people who are in agri have been in agri as a way of life all their lives, so they don't know anything else. It is no wonder that their children are leaving and coming to the cities. The way we have treated our farmers, it's atrocious. We haven't, we haven't given any regard to them and their effort. We haven't helped them. We haven't made it possible for them to enjoy anything like a good life. And yet we expect that their children should stay in the village and continue to do so. 
Why? The same methods of production which are needed. We need to apply it even in our grip. And let me tell you, we complain that Malaysia came to Ghana and they took the palm fruit and now they have made it into a billion dollar industry. What we forget is that a certain Ghanaian young man called Tetekwashi, you know him, went to an island called Fernando Po and brought cocoa. And we made cocoa into a billion dollar industry in Ghana. Ghanaians did it. <coughs> what is the difference? What has happened between when Tetekwashi brought his cocoa? How was it done? How were the economic policy makers of the day? How did they turn cocoa into a billion dollar industry? That is a question we should be asking ourselves. And if we get the answers right, there lies the way to industrialization. I thank you very much. Wow. Do you want to clap again? Because this is, this is, this is really exciting to hear. Um, thought provoking. Thought provoking. Thought provoking. And shortly, I, 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 was, I was seated right next to Mr. Safo Mafo and I saw him making notes. So we're pretty setting that we can, we can hear uh, some solutions. And obviously, Dr. Tunjisi himself profit a few, but of course, it would be good for me to hear from the government point of view as well. We'll do that shortly, but before that, I have a brief commercial break.